from the studio behind the Emoji Movie and the Star. Wait, Sony made that? Comes Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. The third Spider-Man related movie of 2018 attempts to kick off a cinematic universe of its own, featuring six versions of the same character and more villains than Spider-Man 3. Witness the teaser trailer made almost entirely of unfinished test animation and voice acting by one of the stars of Cartoon Network's Incredible Crew. You know what sound a T-Rex makes? Ah! Wow, this movie looks like it's going to be a complete mess. Did I mention it has the same producer as Venom? Oh, so that's why it's one of my favorite films of all time. Nick, 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 the Nick, 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 Nick Tando. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse broke me. It didn't beat me up or take the kids. It simply remains the only film that I just had to see in theaters three separate times. Followed by three more after I got the Blu-ray, and I don't have a problem. It's just that, in my lifetime, there's barely been anything this ambitious and well-crafted in the world of animation. The storytelling and visuals feel so different from what American studios are putting into theaters, but different doesn't always necessarily mean the best. So today, I'll go beyond the hype surrounding the Spider-Verse and see if it is truly deserving of being one of the greatest animated films of all time. Before we dive headfirst into this flick, we need to look at the team behind it. The driving force behind the development of this movie was the dynamic duo of Phil Lord and Chris Miller. They've taken Hollywood by storm, but their success started in animation. After their classic animated teen drama parody Clone High was cancelled in 2003, they wrote and directed an adaptation of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. With these projects, the pair would become known for being able to make even the silliest characters relatable and also tell snappy and heartwarming stories from properties that probably should not have been adapted into film in the first place. Not only were the lessons they learned from these projects carried over into Spider-Verse, but both were given blink or you'll miss it cameos. The reference to Clone High implies that in another dimension, it was successful enough to get a movie, and somehow I nearly predicted its existence a week before clips of it serviced online. Lord and Miller were truly the best people to kickstart this feature, as on paper, Into the Spider-Verse sounds ridiculously bloated, and a desperate tone-deaf attempt to jumpstart a Spidey animated universe. But much of the reason it turned out as coherent as it did is because of the decision that the duo's involvement hinged on, centering this film around Miles Morales. On November 4th, 2008, Barack Obama was elected President of the United States. And around that time, Marvel Comics writer Brian Michael Bendis and artist Sarah Pacelli decided that the world was ready for a black Spider-Man. Three years later, the ultimate incarnation of Spider-Man was killed at the hands of the Green Goblin, leaving the Afro-Latino 13-year-old Miles Morales no choice but to take up the mantle of New York's greatest hero. His design was directly influenced by Donald Glover after his appearance in the season 2 premiere episode of the sitcom Community, which referenced a social media campaign to get him cast as Peter Parker in The Amazing Spider-Man. Who knew that an episode where Betty White drinks piss would have such a long-lasting impact on both the comics industry and this movie? My point with all this background is that Miles was shaped by shifts in modern culture and has only been around for a mere eight years. This meant that there wasn't a long history of adventures to draw from in crafting his story for this movie, and the filmmakers had to be extra careful about how they portrayed a character that represented who Spider-Man was for an entire generation. Their rendition of Miles is just about as average as Peter Parker is on the surface, but the key difference between them lies in the many expectations that surround Miles, well before any radioactive spider shows up. He's torn between living up to his father Jefferson and his uncle Aaron. One enforces the law, and the other lives right under its nose. They see the best sides of themselves in Miles, and want him to embrace the talent and creativity he's holding back from the rest of the world, though they each show that they care in dramatically different ways. We all make choices in life. It doesn't feel like I have a choice. You right don't! Now. The rivalry between Jefferson and Aaron over Miles is not cut and dry, where one is good and the other is evil. How much they understand Miles and how much he wants to impress each of them is not at the forefront of the movie, but it makes the decisions that Miles makes after the spider bite all the more important to his future. Miles also has a subtle internal conflict, illustrated by how one of his shoes is untied. A couple of characters point this out to him, but he intentionally keeps it like this, seemingly as an attempt to develop a trademark look for himself. 
While it's tricky to tell if this tiny detail is maintained throughout the entire movie, there's one moment early on where Miles jumps off a building to test out his powers, but fails when he trips over his laces. You would think that he would end up tying his shoes in order to be the best hero that he could possibly be. And at the beginning of the third act, they call back to this failure in the greatest sequence of the film. Miles holds onto a skyscraper so tightly that he shatters its glass when he leaps off of it. As he falls towards the city, you can see that his shoelace is still untied. Miles may now have a great new responsibility on his shoulders, but he hasn't let it change who he is. Instead, he's changed who Spider-Man is. And after this sequence, you can see that he's taken what he's learned, but put his own spin on it. Now we taught him that, right? I didn't teach him that. And you definitely didn't. While I'm here, I need to talk about this sequence called the Leap of Faith that features the song What's Up Danger by Blackway and Black Caviar. It reinvents the wheel in terms of how web slinging around New York is depicted on screen, and does so by exaggerating the scale of the city to make it feel massive and putting dramatic focus on all of the peaks and valleys that Miles reaches. The top-notch storyboarding works in tandem with an introspective and triumphant anthem, as well as satisfying callbacks to all the advice and failures that Miles has faced throughout the film. The repurposed audio and ways that the music is timed to the action reminds me a bit of a Toonami bumper, only on a much greater level. It's a great bit of filmmaking on its own, but in context, it becomes a nearly perfect combination of everything that Miles has gone through up until this point. But what you might not have known is that it was almost a joke. I'm jumping the gun a bit, but this is an actual alternate version of the scene. And while it does serve a purpose in illustrating that Miles hasn't perfected his web slinging and can get back up after struggling a bit, I'm quite glad that they didn't go with that version. It feels like one of those fake bloopers that Pixar did after their movies ages ago. This is funny enough on its own, but is way too wacky and random to feel at home in an otherwise precisely plotted feature. For years, Marvel has wanted Spider-Man to be the underdog in most media. More often than not, he's been a high school aged teen trying to prove that he can be an Avenger. Great things have come from this iconic and relatable rendition of Spidey, but I can understand why fans may have grown tired of him. But Into the Spider-Verse gives us a different kind of Peter Parker, one in his mid-30s who has broken up with his wife and has been hit hard by a midlife crisis. Now that's something that all the kids can relate to. This is Peter B. Parker, and he's been to hell and back as both a hero and a person. Naturally, he's tired and pessimistic, and that attitude covers his signature snarkiness. This is pretty standard Spider-Man stakes, you get used to it. Watch this, he's gonna say, you've got 24 hours. You've got 24 hours. Jake Johnson's vocal performance really sells all of his dry and straight to the point dialogue. The actor keeps this jaded character likable and has excellent chemistry with Shameik Moore, the voice of Miles. You get the sense that these two are warming up to each other and learning about how to be better heroes. This kid can turn himself invisible. Watch this, he can do it now. I can't do it on command. He can't do it on command, but it is cool. The interesting thing is that despite having a student-mentor relationship, both Miles and Peter stand in the shadow of the same Spider-Man, a flawless amalgam of other on-screen versions of the character. Miles has to live up to him, and he also makes Peter B. Parker feel inferior when you compare their life stories. We don't get to know the Spidey in Miles' universe, as his death is the catalyst that brings all of the Spider-People into Miles' dimension. However, I think that gives this Spider-Man a larger-than-life presence that is able to indirectly challenge both of our protagonists. The only issue I have with perfect Peter Parker is that his introduction is a bit misleading. His backstory is filled with moments similar to ones from previous live-action Spider-Man films, but they have small differences to inform the audience that this is an alternate universe. The problem is, most of the differences are so minor that if you don't know the original films by heart, you may just think that this is the quote-unquote normal universe. So when a Spider-Man from a universe closer to ours is introduced later on, you could be rightfully confused. The gimmicks of each universe are easier to understand as the movie goes on, but I think that a bit more could have been done to clear this issue up right out of the gate. Additionally, I love the humor and style of this opening, but the way it transitions to Miles getting ready for school is a little awkward. I feel like it would have been more interesting to start things off in a very average setting and then gradually bring in the superhero elements. If you wanted to keep the intro, just having Spider-Man appear on a TV in Miles' room would have been enough. But these are both tiny nitpicks to what is otherwise an intense way to kick off this movie. Like, no joke, watching the first few minutes on a plane as it took off was one of the best experiences I've ever had with this film. 
Halfway through, Into the Spider-Verse introduces a few new elements to keep things fresh as it speeds towards the finish line. There's new autumn forest and snow-top suburban environments, but more importantly, we see the full extent of spider people that the multiverse has to offer. Each are introduced with comedic exposition dumps similar to the one that opens the film, but they each feel different. Whether they dive deep into their minds or lives, bring the story to a close, or discuss the pastime of Nazi punching. The escalation of these sequences makes them not only some of the funniest bits in the film, but they show how diverse each of our heroes are, both in design and in character. Spider-Man Noir, Penny Parker, and Spider-Ham are ridiculous riffs on detective serials, anime, and classic Looney Tunes that form cohesive characters. The attention to detail with their lighting, sound effects, or lip sync shows how committed the film is to making sure that these characters feel as authentic to their source material as possible. Having these three stand next to the rest of the cast is a joke within itself, but they don't open the floodgates for comedy to take over. There's a major death just 10 minutes after this trio is brought in, so they provide a little levity around the heaviest moments. After Miles grieves over his uncle's death, one by one, the other spider people discuss the important influences that they've lost in their lives. When they get to Spider-Ham, you expect him to make a funny, but instead, he says this. Miles, the hardest thing about this job is you can't always save everybody. Aw oh, man, I didn't know this cartoon was going to make me feel things. The downside of introducing all these characters with only an hour left is that they have little time for payoffs in the climax. Spider-Gwen suffers from this the most, as she's given the most buildup, with a convoluted backstory and an attempted story arc about her learning to become a team player. But since Gwen sits out so much of the movie, the bond she forms with Miles barely feels earned, like they're suddenly good friends after having three conversations with each other. I read that the filmmakers scrapped their plans for a romance between Gwen and Miles, and perhaps that's why her role in the final version feels downplayed compared to what's set up. Her dialogue and a solid performance by Haley Steinfeld keep Gwen from feeling like a waste of time, but of the main characters, she feels the least fully formed. Just about all the rest have great emotional or comedic payoffs, whether they be big or small, although the sudden destruction of Penny's mech feels a little out of place. Like Gwen, the connection between these two is something that gets little attention throughout the rest of the film, so this moment doesn't quite feel deserved for how much the movie lingers on it. It doesn't kill the momentum of the finale, but its inclusion is a little pointless. With the heroes out of the way, let's talk villains. What we have here is a grab bag of baddies with reimaginings of classic antagonists leading the pack. The biggest one of all is the Kingpin, figuratively and literally. His motivation for messing with the balance of the universe and wanting Spider-Man dead is simple and beautifully illustrated, and he's got such a commanding presence with whatever he does, with him being accurately compared to a black hole by the filmmakers. It's not always about the money, Spider-Man. Kingpin's abstract design was lifted from the comic page, and despite being quite the big boy, he's almost always menacing. The way Kingpin looks and conducts himself makes a simple villain a standout one in an age of forgettable superhero antagonists. How's business? Over it! <laughs> the Prowler is an assassin for hire, dressed up as sort of a lo-fi Iron Man. His bouts with Miles and the rest of the Spider Gang are some of the fastest around, but beyond the spectacle lies the Prowler's emotional edge, his true identity as Miles' Uncle Aaron. Even though he has about as much screen time as Gwen without the mask, we actually get to know him before the twist. Unlike Gwen, who Miles only has a few awkward interactions with. Olivia Octavius is a character that similarly plays off a twist, but she feels more developed because of certain details sprinkled in with her appearances. She reveals herself to Peter B. with this line. My friends actually call me Liv. My enemies call me Doc Ock. Later on, when she takes part in the massive fight at the Parker household, Aunt May says this. Oh great, it's Liv. Just two lines opens up a world of possibilities for the relationship between two minor characters, especially with this Aunt May being as tech-savvy and fearless as she is. A female Dr. Octopus is already an intriguing concept, but little details like these make her so much more. Aaron and Olivia are great examples of characters making the most out of their time in a crowded movie, something I can't say for three other Spider-Verse villains. If you forgot that Green Goblin, Tombstone, and Scorpion were even in this movie, I don't blame you. They've got cool designs and maybe a moment or two worth remembering, but otherwise, they're cannon fodder henchmen. With Kingpin controlling a humongous crime empire, it makes sense that he would have his own squadron of lackeys. 
I just wish we could have seen more from them. I worry that it'll be a while before we see the likes of Tombstone and Scorpion again in other Spidey media, just because of their brief appearances here. Though that may not necessarily be a bad thing if it leads them to think more outside the box with how they're portrayed in the future. Speaking of appearances, the mission statement of production designer Justin K. Thompson with this film was to create a living comic book, and he succeeded. It's impressive how much of its look was solidified from the get-go. A storyboard animation test from animator Alberto Mielgo presents a very stylish and grim version of the film, but much of his test would lay the foundation for its visual language. Trying to design CGI animated films that look both unique and appealing has become a bit of a lost art. I mean, with most character designs, you have your doll faces and your nosy boys. However, you'll likely be able to instantly recognize any frame from Into the Spider-Verse. This is due to a lot of subtle animation techniques that are mostly unique to this production. An effect called an ink line was used on the characters, adding detail that emphasized features and emotions, making the characters feel more distinct and defined. The cast is also animated on every other frame, giving their movements more impact, especially with the lack of motion blur and inclusion of smear frames that emulate 2D animation. There's a similar lack of autofocus, as the film instead opts to distort everything around the center of each shot, occasionally blurring the edges of color to imitate a misprint or the color schemes of old 3D glasses. This is also accomplished with subtle screen tones that draw attention towards different light sources, with hashing identifying dark spots and dots identifying light spots. There's more blatant homages too, with various graphic splash cards, the screen being segmented into different panels, and text boxes that represent Miles' inner thoughts. When you compare this to Spider-Man's first on-screen appearance in the Timeless Electric Company shorts, it's very impressive how much more natural the integration of comic book design tropes is. Though despite how noble this attempt was, let's be frank, nothing will ever compare to that interpretation. Well, if it isn't the wall-crawling creep, here's one wall you'll never crawl, you red and blue buffoon! He's so dumb, he's trying to eat a hot dog with no mouth! I once compared the look of this movie to living concept art, and it's due to the high attention to detail present in almost every aspect. All of the environments feel so lived in, especially New York City. In my opinion, this is the first time that a Spider-Man adaptation has successfully captured the urban environment of its city. It's coated in imperfections, like crime and graffiti on the walls, and cracks, trash, and hobos on every sidewalk. Compare this to the soft, candy-coated playland that The Secret Life of Pets presents New York as, which just isn't as accurate to the dog-eats-dog -dog world that it truly is. I'm not saying that I want Vore in a Secret Life of Pets film, but the grit and depth that Spider-Verse brings to its Big Apple makes it a lot more appealing. All of the background characters have their quirks too, like this one scientist at Alchemex who could care less about Spider-Man showing up and just wants to finish her coffee. Then there's the Smirker. I believe this man to be the true villain of the film. Someone who radiates this much chaotic energy just has to be up to something. He's gotta be the guy who released the spider who bit Miles. I mean, this film is so well thought out that the inciting incident can't just be a plot hole. Oh no, wait, I think I just found an actual plot hole. An insane amount of effort went into crafting the action. All of the characters move and interact with their surroundings, but it's the way those surroundings differ that make the action really special. During the sequence where Miles drags Peter through New York while attached to a speeding train, the duo passes by a dozen different blocks, and each had their own lighting key, becoming more and more saturated with neon signs. The filmmakers faced the opposite challenge with the house fight. You have 11 different characters battling simultaneously in only one room. But if you have a keen eye, you can track the movements of nearly all of them as the fight plays out. Despite the premise being so complex, the sequence is staged beautifully, and it's almost a bit too good, as the much more unrestrained finale pales a bit in comparison. A few of the montages are just as quick and complicated, so kudos also goes to the editing for stringing together all of the different angles and perspectives present into something coherent. The visual spectacle even continues into the ending title sequence. It builds upon the splash cards from the film to create stylized dioramas with echoed character animation and kaleidoscope-like distorted visuals built around colorful callbacks and references to old Spider-Man memes. It feels like a music video, one that keeps the momentum of the film going until the very end. On the topic of music, the soundtracks to Spider-Man movies have had their highs. The 
the very first joke in Spider-Verse is a reference to that moment of cinematic mastery from Spider-Man 3, and by some miracle, the score gets better from there. That's not even the best Raimi trilogy reference they have. If we're looking strictly at the original soundtrack tie-in, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Not too much of it makes its way into the film's score, but what does is rather brief and usually meshes well with the tone of the scene. Although whoever thought the appropriate thing to play after two different characters die, plus Lil Wayne and Juice World, is clearly a big dummy. However, the original score from Connect Adventures composer Daniel Pemberton is something truly special. The soundtrack goes from licensed pop and hip hop before Miles gets bit to heavy and synthesized percussion when Miles starts using his powers to triumphant orchestral pieces when Spider-Man arrives on the scene to a mix of all three previous styles when Miles finally masters his powers. The evolution of Miles' character is evident from just listening to the score, though I'm not really sure where Lil Wayne and Juice World fit into that. The use of record scratching and remixing vocal tracks reminds me of Jet Set Radio on a much grander scale, and I'm also very fond of the way that the style of instrumentation changes to match whatever combination of characters are on screen. I'm surprised that more animation isn't scored with this concept in mind. They even went so far as to release a five-track Christmas album based off of a quick joke where Spider-Man contemplates his life choices and Miles plugs his GoFundMe. This movie truly is the gift that keeps on giving. As much as I love the score, I could do without it being louder than the character dialogue during intense portions of the film. Some of the audio mixing makes me want to turn on subtitles, but other times it's ingeniously done. Like during a scene where Jefferson drives Miles to school, you can occasionally hear music being blasted from cars that pass them by. That's such a cool little touch. I don't know if that was me, Dad. And the two from yesterday on Clinton. Spider-Verse is pretty much built to be watched frame by frame for all the quick gags and cameos, which makes buying it on Blu-ray or digital a must, especially for the alternate universe mode feature. It's a cut of the movie that spices in an extra half hour of animatics and unfinished scenes back into the movie. There's some symbolic dream sequences, a few scenes between Jefferson and Aaron, an explanation for where Spider-Ham was when the Spider Gang infiltrated Fisk Tower, and an extended gag about Peter B. getting arrested for streaking when he first passes over into Miles' universe. This is a really tasteless bit, man. It's not a bit. You'll know when it's a bit. My bits are funny. That's why we covered him up. The most significant thing cut wasn't even a scene. It was the character of Miles' roommate, Gonke. He would have motivated Miles to follow his destiny, and brought in some more comedy by trying to use the DVD commentary of an over-glamorized in-universe Spider-Man movie as a guide for how to be a better hero. Gonke's role as a sidekick and support system to Miles would have distracted from the student-mentor relationship at the center of the final film. He either would have had to disappear in the first half or be a third wheel on the adventure. So in the end, I think this movie was better off with him in the background. Despite not saying a single word in the version we got, Gonke still has a presence in the film. We usually see him busy working on his laptop, and his workaholic attitude and superhero obsession take over the dorm he shares with Miles. They laid down the groundwork for giving Miles an interesting companion in the already confirmed sequel, but there's so many possibilities of what else could be done with that. I just want to explore all these different dimensions that we got glimpses of, meet new spider people, maybe see how Venom would spread from universe to universe, or the cast could just go watch the Clone College movie. I'd be fine with that too. I think the most likely scenario is that we see what happened in the home dimensions of all the spider people while they were off in Miles' dimension. As above all else, that seems to be what the ending of this movie is alluding to, especially with every other sequel that Lord and Miller have had a hand in, picking up right after the first film left off. Got a minute? I think I made just about every point I wanted to about Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. So with all that I've said about this movie, is it really some of the best that animated films have to offer? The plot is bursting at the seams with characters. It couldn't be a more obvious setup for a franchise. And if you aren't a fan of Spider-Man, you might not pick up on all of the references or central thematic elements. But whenever I watch this movie, I never think about all these issues. Every single aspect has been built with so much precision and passion that it's hard to find much to truly complain about without explicitly looking for it, which I'll admit I did a bit for this video, but just for the sake of being comprehensive. 
The story it tells may not be entirely groundbreaking, but the ways it uses the medium of animation to bring that story to life sets a new watermark for the industry as a whole. Even though it didn't follow the story of the comic event it was based on, the movie was so good that no comic book fans complained about that, which might just be a first for the genre. If you couldn't stand it for being too silly, too fast-paced, or too self-referential, I get where you may be coming from. I know that it leans heavily on the audience being familiar with Spider-Man's history, and I'm biased because I've already spent several videos dissecting his cartoons, and will definitely spend several more, but who cares? This movie is awesome! Sure, it over relies on its source material, but in doing so, it creates one of the most exciting and beautiful films that I've ever seen. If this is your first Spider-Man movie, then I almost envy you. I say almost because it's only downhill from here. It's not birthday. Now it's time for me to light my candles! I hope those proposed TV projects are able to see the light of day, though I would hate for this to become another LEGO movie situation, where the oversaturation of spin-off films and shows burn out audiences before a proper sequel. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse got me insanely excited for the future of this character on screen and theatrical animation in general, and I cannot wait to see what follows in its footsteps. And to think, all of this probably wouldn't have happened as it did if it weren't for that episode of Community that also had this moment in it. Ha! <laughs> Gay!